we have our one and only panel of the summit coming up next, featuring three leaders from our community. Our moderator and my colleague, Tim Stubich, will introduce our panelists, so I'll take the opportunity to introduce Tim to all of you. Since joining Canary in March 2021 as Senior Director of Business Development, Tim has been engaged in establishing partnerships with stakeholder communities to explore and define new business opportunities for Canary and provide recommendations to improve the successful implementation and execution of existing Canary programs, particularly in cybersecurity. Tim came to Canary from MyTax, where he developed strategies to strengthen business-driven research internships in key priority areas. He also had an extensive career in the federal government where he served as director for the development of the Digital Research Infrastructure Strategy, the $2 billion Knowledge Infrastructure Program and strategic contributions to research organizations like the CFI, Genome Canada, uh, CIFAR and the Institute for Quantum Computing and many others. Tim knows our community. He's a professional engineer and holds a mechanical engineering degree and an MBA from the University of Manitoba. Tim is joining us from Ottawa, Ontario. I have to say, I'm, uh, thank you, Catherine. I'm honored today to be, be the moderator. I'm excited to be the moderator for uh, this uh, esteemed group of panel members uh, who are going to speak to the cybersecurity state of the nation in Canada's higher education sector. I don't want to waste any time. I want to bring them up here on the virtual stage with me right away. So on the panel, we have Dr. Barb Kara, president and CEO of Cybera, a not-for-profit technology neutral organization responsible for driving economic growth in Alberta through the use of uh, digital technology, as well as facilitating Alberta's research and education network. She's a respected leader and collaborative partner within Canada's National Research and Education Network, the NREN, with a PhD in applied research, spatial statistics, and data modeling. And I never knew that about Barb, even though I've known her for many years prior to this as a panel. Uh, Barb has over a decade of experience in data analytics and policy, which allows her to act as that bridge between research and the technical domains. And that insight has proved vital to Cyber, where uh, it has pre frequently acted as a steward uh, and advocate for Alberta research and data-driven decisions. Uh, Barb spearheaded the development of Cyber's policy, strategic and operational initiatives, including programs that are strengthening the cybersecurity posture of Alberta's education sector. Barb is joining us today from Calgary, Alberta. Welcome, Barb. Uh, we also have uh, Wensi Laum, the Associate Vice President, University Systems and Chief Information Officer, CIO at the University of Victoria. In this role, Wensi is responsible for the institutional institution's IT, IT strategy, policy, governance, and projects to enable UVic's academic and research and administrative functions. She also leads the operation of Arbutus, the uh, Canada's National Research Cloud Platform under the Compute Canada Federation. And she serves on boards for BCNet, which is the Higher Education Shared Services Organization for BC's 25 post-secondary institutions, on the Canadian University Council of CIOs, CUCIO, and a community organization uh, called the Victoria Foundation. Her work in uh, cybersecurity and education includes roles as uh, chair of BCNet's uh, Cybersecurity and Identity Management Services Committee, uh, the CUCIO Standing Committee on Cybersecurity, Canary's own um, Cybersecurity Advisory Committee, and the Compute Canada Cybersecurity Steering and Advisory Committee. Uh, Wensi is joining us today from uh, Victoria, BEC. Thank you very much, uh, Wensi. And uh, Rasha Nazra. Uh, Rasha leads uh, engagement and partnerships 
for your academia at the federal government's Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. She holds a doctoral degree in educational leadership from Western University, a master's degree in educational technology from Concordia. She's previously held different roles at the Cyber Centre, including leading a strategic cyber threat assessments team. Prior to joining the Cyber Centre, she held different managerial and academic positions at organizations, including Canada Post Corporation and Ryerson University. Rosh is joining us today from Ottawa, Ontario. Um, the structure we have for the panel, um, we're going to ask them to provide uh, perspectives, which are going to range from a CIO at an institution, uh, Barb at a regional NREN partner, and then finally the uh, perspective from the federal government organization, uh, Rasha, leading the, the cyber center's engagement with the academic community. And from each of the, the, those uh, their perspectives, the panel members will give a quick overview of the assets and initiatives that, that they currently uh, make available to the ecosystem. And after that, we will try to move into a bit more of a dialogue on challenges and opportunities in the sector, uh, with a view to exploring how we may be able to collaborate more broadly to strengthen cybersecurity capabilities across the sector. I have a few questions that uh, prepared to, to begin the dialogue, but we really encourage you to post uh, into the chat questions that occur to you along the way. So to uh, kick off the presentations, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Wensi Lum. Wensi? Thanks a lot, Tim. Hello, everyone. It's really great to see all of us together in this virtual room. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective as a Canadian university CIO. I believe that even with the importance of CISOs and our growing pool of cybersecurity talent in universities, the CIO has a crucial role to play as a business and technology leader. We can help knit together the story for managing cybersecurity and cyber risk and technology and help enable a national mobilization of resources to solve this wicked problem that we all share. So let me tell you a little bit about UVic and how we fit into this picture. So we're a mid-sized research university and by the numbers that means we have about 22,000 students in undergrad and grad programs and over 5,000 faculty, staff, and librarians, and a budget of about $450 million. So in terms of my role, what that means is, as the technology leader on campus, I'm responsible for the computing that supports all this environment, the academic research and admin areas, and we operate in a very heterogeneous, decentralized model. So I have this amazing team of 140 staff in central IT, including 40 students that do all this. And my cybersecurity team is about eight people. And overall, I, could, I think IT is about 4% of our, our UVic budget. So with these fairly modest resources, how do I tackle such a huge problem like cybersecurity? And the answer lies in our community assets. It's about our ability as CIOs to connect experts across the sector, to collaborate and share expertise, and to share this challenge and potential solutions. I'm really fortunate to be here because you know, I work within this ecosystem of a national network of engaged CIOs and, and CISOs. We have a history of working together, and in some cases, that's for decades. And the Cuccio community, the Canadian University Council of CIOs, Tim mentioned we have that standing committee on cybersecurity, which is a group of CIOs that represent you know, cybersecurity initiatives in the sector. And then we also have organized our CISOs and the security directors and professionals in a special interest group. So that's the Cuccio SIG for security. And we have an information sharing protocol the traffic light protocol, so to speak. And that helps us to share threat intelligence, incidents, and other information between organizations. And through this CIO community has emerged some really cool initiatives, like the BitSight security benchmarking initiatives. And this was spearheaded by Brian Lesser, 
the CIO at Ryerson and has been turned into a national program. So the key message is that universities don't operate alone. We have an ecosystem and that ecosystem is worth the National Research and Education Network, right? The NREN, which is Canary, and all of our regional partners. In my case, it's BCNet, which functions as our network and our higher ed shared services. CIOs have influence, and that's the cool thing. We have influence outside of our organizations. So I'm able to play a role at BCNet through the board of directors to help drive some focus on cybersecurity and sector solutions there, as well as at Canary. And I apologize, the garbage trucks are coming, so you'll hear some racket in the last few minutes of my, my spiel. But I, right now, I think we're in a great moment because Canary is emerging as that national lead for cybersecurity. And that cybersecurity initiatives program that's been launched, I'm really glad to be part of that team that helps to bring my understanding of our campus technology challenges so we can advocate for that unique context of universities and develop the best sector-wide responses and make intelligent investments. I'll mute before the truck drives closer. Oh, thank you very much, Wednesday. And, uh, <laughs> and that was a good segue. You mentioned NREN and, and BARB. And no, no, the part about the NREN, not the part about the garbage truck, thank you. But uh, I'll turn it over to you now, BARB. Great, thanks. Actually, Wincy, that was a perfect segue into what I'm going to speak about, and that's around the assets and strength of the NREN in terms of what we're bringing to the table. And, you know, I'm reminded yesterday, actually, this day one of the summit, where Charles Finley mentioned uh, the principles of good collaboration. And that was based and predicated on the concept of trust, transparency, and shared, clear, common goals. Right. And when I think about the strength of the NREN and how we work with our member institutions, one of our strongest assets is how we work with the community. Wincy, and you alluded to this, right? You are a member of BCNet. You help drive that regional opportunity. And so the strength of those NREN partners is we're member driven organizations. Our role is to foster those relationships and leverage those relationships within our institutions. And we're continually there to engage and meet the needs and provide that feedback loop for opportunities with our membership community, the institution. So when we work that closely to the ground, we're there to, and we want to stand up a cybersecurity service, or we want to work with them in terms of creating new opportunities, we do it with them as partners at the table. And that makes that opportunity more valued, more uh, deployed, more used, and it creates a lot more opportunity to evolve it into the future. When a new national opportunity is launched, the NREN is perfectly positioned then to drive some of those national opportunities to our members to make sure they're engaged, they're taking advantage of the opportunities as they flow down through our federated structure. And the other thing I would know from an interim perspective um, in terms of our strength and asset that we're bringing to the table, you know, we've grown up for over 25 years running and operating the National Research Education Network. And that speaks to the strength and the foundation of the technology in terms of what we're building cybersecurity on top of, right? We have that expertise in the landscape uh, in terms of managing a technology platform already across a national system. Not an easy feat on its own when you think about national structures, provincial structures, entities, and the, and the differences across the country. But to do it all in a collective way where we're driving benefit and value back down to our members. Uh, when we think about, again, how we leverage that technology to build on top of, um, we want to use that networking expertise to now look at the challenge of cybersecurity, right? How do we invest in that? And so from an NREN perspective, we've come to the table, we've looked at building the national SIM, we've looked at standing up uh, a cybersecurity analyst team across the country, so we're growing and sharing that expertise from the foundation of technology. And then last thing, the last thing I want to mention is highlighting the strength of the NREN Federation structure itself. Um, the structure of the NREN in itself is that we're coming together, 14 leaders across the country come to the table 
with varying, you know, membership, varying sizes, varying models behind us, and varying member communities behind us. But we all come with the same common goal and purpose and the same commitment in mind. How can we collaboratively work together to tackle the challenge of cybersecurity that benefits our member institutions? And so I think our strength is actually in that diversity of thought and experience in terms of how we come to the table to look at new opportunities to work on together. And the common goal, again, is to identify those joint initiatives to strengthen the people, processes, and tools in direct response to the needs of our community. So a, a good feedback loop in terms of collaboration across the entire system. Tim, I'll throw it back to you. Thanks very much, Barb. And, uh... And I think Wednesday's garbage truck is interfering with your sound a little bit there, but it, it came, came, came through a little bit choppy. But uh, I'd also like to get uh, Rasha to provide uh, a glimpse of the activities that Cyber Center provides to the higher education community. Awesome. Thank you very much. So um, as introduced, I'm the partnership lead for the academic sector at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, and I'm really thrilled to be presenting, representing the, the Cyber Centre and to be given this opportunity to, to speak uh, at the summit. Um, at a very high level, the partnership team's role at the Cyber Centre is to provide cybersecurity advice, guidance and services to IT security professionals. Um, in the academic sector, uh, so a lot of you guys. But I'd like to start off about talking a little bit about the Cyber Center itself because that's sort of uh, where we uh, have uh, our biggest assets or where our assets are located. So the Cyber Center is essentially a business line for the Communication Security Establishment, CSE. And the Cyber Center is Canada's authority on cybersecurity and the single source of expert advice, guidance, services, and support from the Government of Canada. And I do have to say from the Government of Canada that there are other sources out there, uh, but uh, I just needed to highlight that. Um, CAC has a very long history, uh, almost 75 years this year, of providing IT security advice and guidance to the Government of Canada. And in 2018, uh, the IT security business line at CSC amalgamated with the IT security line at Public Safety and the IT security line at uh, uh, Shared Services Canada and created uh, the Cyber Center. Uh, so the same way that you'd go to Environment Canada for a weather report or to Health Canada to to get about you know information about COVID or the food guide. Uh, when it comes to cybersecurity operational matters uh, from the federal government, uh, you now come to the cyber center. Uh, but I also think it's important to note what the cyber center is not, uh, because uh, there might be some confusion out there as to what we do and we don't do. Uh, the cyber center is not a regulator. We do not regulate anything. Uh, we are not law enforcement. Uh, that is the job of the RCMP or the police of jurisdiction. If there's an incident, we can absolutely facilitate facilitate any connections that need to happen between a victim organization um, and the appropriate police uh, or, uh, or the CMP, but we are not uh, law enforcement. And we're certainly not a newsroom of any kind. Uh, we do not share the names or the issues of any institutions that we work with or that report any cyber incidents to us uh, with anybody. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to make sure that that, that uh, was clear. Um, so the creation of the Cyber Center actually brought operational um, security experts from across the government as you see from Shared Services Canada, Public Safety under one roof, which was in line with the National Cybersecurity Strategy of Canada in general. Um, and uh, this represents a shift for a more unified approach to cybersecurity in our country. Um, until August 2019, we operated under the National Defense Act, uh, which only allowed us to actually provide cybersecurity advice and guidance to the government of Canada. But since then, um, a new act was passed, the CSE Act, uh, and we are now for the first time ever uh, permitted to offer uh, the advice and guidance that we give to the Government of Canada to critical infrastructure owners and operators, such as the academic institutions and their service providers, which is, which is very new for, for us and very exciting as well. Uh, one thing to note, though, is that there are 16 critical infrastructure sectors uh, that we support, and the academic sector is, is one of those, and I happen to be the, the lead for the academic sector. So um, as our mandate expanded, uh, we've been tasked with protecting, with protecting these additional sectors. Um, each of these sectors, as you know, and we've heard throughout the summit, you know, uh, faces unique cybersecurity challenges. Each has their unique operational environment to take in into consideration when providing any kind of advice and guidance. But uh, while the sectors themselves may be unique and different, um, and I hope this became evident throughout the last couple of days of the summit, the threats that we face uh, as a community, uh, regardless of sector, are not that different. 
uh, from each other. Uh, ransomware, I think, was brought up in each and every talk, and and, and I will bring it up again uh, in in my uh, in my part today. Uh, one thing that I tend to hear is that sometimes uh, people refer to the academic sector as being different, uh, and that potentially you know outsiders may not necessarily understand the needs of the sectors, and and maybe that there is definitely different, uh, but I, I don't necessarily agree that it's uh, entirely accurate. I'm a former academic myself, and while it's absolutely true that the research and education sector um, has its unique challenges. Definitely, there are there is similar diversity in terms of security challenges when we look at other sectors as well. Uh, for example, if we look at the transportation, which is one of the other critical infrastructure sectors uh, we're responsible for, automotive, just uh, you know. Uh, related back to what uh, Dr. Mitra was talking about. It's very different from railway. It's very different from aviation, uh, so on and so forth. So just because there are idiosyncratic ch challenges within a sector, it doesn't really mean that we cannot address those challenges. And it certainly doesn't mean that we don't understand them or that we can't collaborate and figure out a way to, to, to work around them. Um, as I mentioned, um, we support the cybersecurity needs for the government of Canada. Um, and believe me, there's a lot of diversity there. Uh, when we talk about the different ministries and different organizations, they, they're extremely, extremely different. Um, and we also now have the added um, additional mandate of supporting all Canadians, which we do through our Get CyberSafe uh, website. Um, so in essence, the Cyber Center's overall mission and vision is to protect and, and safeguard Canadian networks and data, to inform Canadians and Canadian organizations on cyber threats and to provide advice and guidance, and to most importantly, empower institutions, uh, their own abilities to secure their systems and their data through collaboration and, and partnership. Uh, the work that we do addresses a very important federal priority uh, with significant uh, resources behind it. Uh, we have a lot of in-house expertise throughout the many years and throughout the amalgamation of the different organizations that created the Cyber Center. And there's certainly a very strong desire to leverage these strengths to meet the unique needs of, of the academic sector for, for sure. Um, back to you, Tim. Well, thanks very much for that, Rasha. That's uh, very interesting and some uh, and a little bit of controversy already, I think. But one of the things I wanted to check in with you on, uh, with um, I mean, the Cyber Center, it's it's relatively new. We have universities in this country over 100 years old, so it's interesting that you're you're in a very different context than that. But you've got sort of an international perspective from from where you're sitting, and what are you seeing? Um, with respect to nation state actors and evolving cybersecurity threats. And, and now, are there things in particular that the education sector needs to be more aware of? I mean, Wensi already mentioned, this is a wicked problem. It sounds like it's just getting wickeder, but could you provide some of that international uh, flavor? Absolutely, absolutely. So. Uh... Prior to actually taking over this role, uh, my team was responsible for for producing threat assessments, and and uh, one of the more uh, recent ones by recent it was 2020, uh, the Cyber Center published the National Cyber Threat Assessment uh, uh, for on our external website. It's available for anybody to to go uh, download and, and read. Uh, the previous one was done in 2018, and it's a quite it's an interesting read. It's uh, it's meant for the general public in general, but. Um, the key judgments at the time, and this is a year ago, uh, not surprisingly were that the number of cyber attacks is increasing and becoming more sophisticated. Uh, cyber crime and ransomware will continue to target critical infrastructure sectors, including academia, and that state-sponsored programs of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, uh, we actually specified those uh, countries, pose the greatest strategic threat to Canada um, as they conduct espionage against Canadian businesses, academia, and, and government to steal Canadian intellectual property. Um, just prior to the publication of the National Cyber Threat Assessment, uh, we also produced a cyber threat bulletin on ransomware specifically and its evolution. And in it, we, we said that uh, we judge, we being the Cyber Center, not myself, uh, almost certainly that ransomware were, you know, directed against Canadians in the next 12 months will continue to target large enterprises at the time and critical infrastructure providers, as well as organizations of all sizes, and that many Canadian victims will continue to acquiesce to ransom demands due to the severe economic 
economic and potentially destructive uh, consequences of refusing payment, as we've seen a lot of the leak sites uh, that, that are out there. Um, and that we, we also said we assess that it's almost certain that cyber criminals will continue to scale up their ransomware operations and attempt to coerce larger uh, payments from victims threatening to leak or sell their data online. Uh, so while we we're initially, we were actually trying to forecast 12 months ahead. Uh, several months later, literally January, we had to actually issue an updated bulletin about ransomware and, and that we published again, it's on our website. Um, and in it, we said that the successful uh, targeted ransomware campaigns typically involve organized cyber criminal groups uh, with specialized roles. So we're starting to see specialization and significant resources behind them. Uh, targeted ransomware campaigns are adopting the, the techniques, uh, the TTPs of advanced persistent threats. So those that are supported by nation states. Uh, in terms of like, uh, we're seeing initial entry, uh, you know, establishment of persistence, uh, uh, exfiltration of data, network recon, privilege escalation, lateral movement, and so on. And we also, and we also said at the time that um, targeting is very broad, uh, typically through phishing campaigns. That that has not changed. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of uh, loader uh, botnet activity, RDP scanning, um, hiring of affiliates, and as well as uh, um, MSP targeting. Uh, but the target selection at the time was focused was focused. Uh, believe it or not, we're, we're actually working on another um, update that's forthcoming, forthcoming just because of how rapidly things are changing. Um, it's not going to be an assessment, but it's going to be a revolving around ransomware again. And while I have not seen it and I cannot quote it verbatim or directly, I do know one thing that I was said after several years or just even one year of trying to address this issue, uh, not just in Canada, but internationally and globally, I wish I could say that things have gotten better. Uh, in fact, I am fairly certain that what's going to come out is going to say that things are worse uh, and they're going to probably get worse before they get better. Uh, ransomware and just malware in general is not just a cybersecurity problem, it's really a national security security uh, problem as well. Um, and this was mentioned in previous talks, but we're seeing increased specialization, we're seeing changes in targeting, we're seeing more sophisticated malware that is getting better at evading detection. And some of the reasons behind this are that the same technologies that we use to defend our systems, whether it's automation, AI, machine learning, are also being leveraged by cyber criminals uh, because they're not that expensive anymore. Uh, you know, anybody can get a cloud accountant and get access to these tools um, and they're bettering their tools. So we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, new variants that come around um, the time to exploit, uh, you know, a vulnerability from when it's known to when it's actually exploited is, is in the hours, not even in the days sometimes. And this is becoming an exceedingly uh, difficult problem. So uh, I hope that kind of gives you a bit of an idea of what, what's going on. It's a bit of a busy time, but um, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a challenging time for everybody, that's for sure. Thanks, Rasha. Yes, the words of encouragement. It's only going to get worse before it gets better. Oh, boy. Um, well, and I want to give a chance uh, now uh, for Wincy to talk about, I mean, the comment about is higher education fundamentally different in certain ways. So, I mean, I, I see a lot of things about there is probably some uniqueness to the context of higher education. Um, Wendy, can you maybe look at the, address that question from your perspective on campus? I, thanks Tim. And I do think it's valid to say that higher ed does have some unique aspects. I agree on the commonality because ultimately people are, are at the center of many of the problems that we're talking about in cybersecurity. So, you know, you can talk about what's unique in higher ed, like our bicameral governance, because we have boards and senates for, for many of our decision-making processes. And I think it's cool personally that we have students as part of our governance structures. But if we're talking about cybersecurity, like my biggest challenge as a CIO in higher ed is something I call the complexity versus consistency paradox. So it relates to decentralized IT and the complexity that it introduces. And for me, complexity is the enemy of security. So on the one hand, I have to operate in this very heterogeneous environment because of the principles of academic freedom and specialized needs for research. I'd have really angry people at my door if I tried to standardize things like you see in other industries. But on the other hand, you also have people who expect and demand consistency with services, especially for security. They want things to work reliably and in a predictable manner. 
And then the difficult part is in this environment, it isn't always possible. So the life of the CIO and IT department is about balancing these two things, right? So speaking to all of the service providers out there, we need to understand this complexity and make sure we have products and services that can deal with all of that. And if we're in the university, we need to create an environment where we accept that there's a bit of residual risk of stuff not working as expected, because that's not what you're going to see when you broadly implement security measures that touch all sorts of stuff that central IT doesn't directly manage. Um, another aspect of higher ed that I think is unique is we're not just the research and education sector, we're actually multiple industry verticals within a sector. So we have food and hospitality, accommodation, retail, health, arts, finance, event, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and they're very highly specialized functions as well to support the research mission and libraries. Plus we have interesting things on our campuses like power plants and utilities and smart building control systems. So that diversity of what we actually manage is, it gives me pause some days. And what all this translates to for me is a really large number of connections and relationships with people who manage all of this stuff and the layers of university governance on top of that. So you can look at it two ways. You could take the negative point of view that this causes a lot of stakeholder relationships and, and people bringing people on board and getting their support. Or you could look at your colleagues as potential allies and some of them can play a role as catalysts and champions to help move things forward. And I have to consciously, intentionally look at things as the latter. And I've found a lot of support for that model. Some of the presentations that we heard in previous days talked about that importance of engaging top level executives across the organization. And I totally agree with that. And I'm really fortunate to have a president and executive who are very supportive of cybersecurity. However, I don't think I'm alone in my thinking that higher ed isn't a traditionally hierarchical environment either. As a colleague once told me in our world, sometimes 99 to one is still a tie. And so what I've learned through this process is that people will resist or try to slow down the implementation of cybersecurity usually because of some kind of fear, you know, fear of loss of control, perceived loss of status, fear that their special system won't work. And I took a bit of a wild card approach in this and that I didn't do the usual and bring in a big technology consulting firm, write up a report, flash that around to rationalize the change. So for some of the more difficult things that I'm tackling, in cybersecurity and change, I've been using an HR consulting approach and an executive coach for my team to equip them, not with cybersecurity tools, but with conflict management tools. So we have different mental models to address complex change. And that gets to the root of what Rasha was talking about, like, in, you know, what are the common pieces, right? And addressing stakeholder engagement so we can better handle some of these difficult negotiations. But the good news is, you know, our, I am very well supported by an awesome community of other CIOs. And with that support of my colleagues nationally, and where I can see and bring forward these great examples where people are doing things right and shine an example, a light on those, that gives me fuel where we need to move things forward. Well, that's fantastic, Wincy. I just thinking about the complexity of, of what you're dealing with, and there's so many different issues, but and, and in the context of stakeholder relations, I know, Barb, that you're out there a lot talking to your community all across Alberta, uh, all the institutions you deal with. Um, are, you know, are there some things that are coming up more and more often or like, what are the top of mind things? Because we can't tackle everything at once, but are there are there two or three or a handful of things that you could really say, these are where we should probably place some emphasis going forward? 
Yeah, that's a good question, Tim. And hopefully my audio is a bit better this time and less choppy as I go through, but keep me posted, of course. Um, I do. You know, honestly, that's our role is to go out there and crowdsource the things we're hearing, honestly, to see if we can look for opportunities, consistencies, you know, understand the biggest challenges folks are faced with. And I could give you three answers, I guess, eight people, 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 or people, people, and money. <laughs> um, and often, you know, a lot of that comes up as the caveat in terms of what they're able to accomplish in other areas. Unfortunately, it is a big challenge, right? There's a real legitimate concern about access to expertise, but not only just access in this moment in time, but also in um, the long term. When we think about retention and sustainability of tackling this challenge longer than just this moment in time or being able to take one of the initiatives that are being offered out there in the in the cybersecurity initiatives program, right? I have a great story. I have a smaller institution in my landscape. There's all these great initiatives and opportunities that are coming down. And, you know, they come back to say, Barb, I don't have the time and energy to stand this up, or I don't have the resources to actively participate in this, or I can't participate and take the best, you know, leverage it to the best ability because I don't have anybody on my team to do this. It's me. And, you know, cybersecurity is off the side of my desk sometimes because there's competing other priorities within the institution. And so that is a very real concern for some of the organizations. And then when you flip it and you look at some of the bigger ones, those con concerns are the same. They just scale in different ways, right? There may be more to tackle or it may be slightly more complex. And so, you know, how do you solve the problem of people today? But really, how do you solve the people of and problem of retention and sustainability into the future? And I think that's one of the more problematic challenges that we have to start getting creative around solving as a collective, right? What is the talent pipeline we need to put in place to support this? Is there work integrated learning opportunities or internship programs where you work as Enron partners with our uh, post-secondary institutions to drive some of that talent up through the system? And, you know, we have to accept the fact that they're not always going to stay with us. They're going to go on to bigger and better things, but for that time that they spend with us, we hope we can capture some really innovative, new, fresh thinking also about how we're tackling that challenge together, right? You never know what's going to come up through the system. And we do have to capitalize on that opportunity and put some time and energy into, I think, solving that problem. You know, when we think about financial budget cuts, you know, folks do have priorities they have to change off. Um, you know, it's institution by institution, it's NREN partner by NREN partner in terms of what we can accomplish on any given budget cycle or annual year, but we recognize we have to think about these things for that longer term benefit. The other thing I hear quite often in the community is how do we simplify the complexity and confusion in the landscape? So it's not always a bad thing, but again, if you're an institution looking up at everything that's coming out at you, how do you prioritize what you do first? How do you know where to go if you need some help with something? And so a lot of that is like, how can we leverage those stakeholder relationships and partnerships to understand, to drive that information down the right way too, right? Because it can be overwhelming. And so how do we work together to simplify that landscape? That is a big one I have. How do we tackle the priorities? If we came up with and we work on, and, and there's a little bit of a teaser, we launched the National IS Assessment Service that we're going to stand up as an NREN, and we work with our institutions to go down that road. We start talking about cybersecurity challenges, gaps, and opportunities in a common language, and we understand the needs in the community that we'd start tackling those challenges in a very directed way that can prioritize that benefit of the future investment we need to make into the system. So that's one of the big strategic items I think we have right there in front of us that we can work on as a community that will really drive forward future opportunities and put us on the path to solving some of the biggest gaps and challenges we're faced with. That's that's great. Uh, this this talent gap issue, I mean, what are the what are the issues? People, people, people. That's that's uh, that's such an important one. It, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Wendy, on are there things that we could be doing? I know it came up earlier in the conference, especially on day one, in the summit day one, where uh, Charles Finley and uh, and the Israeli speaker talked a lot about how to address talent and, and, and really cool things about hacking competitions and bug bounties and stuff like that. Is there more that we could be doing 
in a more innovative space or just anything to really try to fill this talent gap? So I think we no longer just have a talent gap, it's becoming a talent crisis. And, you know, those of us who are out there hiring for positions, it's brutal. And I have the joyful position of also being in a super hot real estate market with million dollar plus homes, um, combined with public sector wages and a really hot IT job market, right? So I've had to fail multiple competitions for senior positions, including cybersecurity. But despite our challenges and, and the odds of hiring, um, we've actually had good success in building our cybersecurity team. And I'm proud to say this is the best security team I've worked with in our career. Like we started with just a manager and one analyst four years ago, and now we're up to eight incredibly smart people led by our CISO, now Bassi. And our success has been from strategically promoting from within. So grooming, finding people, moving them around, finding the right core skills and, and aptitude. And then what we're trying to do now is build some kind of training vertical growth for people within the team. But if we really want to address the talent gap at the sector level, I think we need to move the dial on two big things. The first is around leadership, and the second is diversity, equity, and inclusion. For leadership is important because that's the one thing we can directly control. We can't always control the, the, the wage schemes that we pay people. But as a CIO, I can have the I can be the best leader I can be and I can create the best possible environment for a security team. And that means advocating for resources, removing barriers, connecting people with a strong mission and purpose and connecting people in the sector so they feel as they're part of that they're part of a community. And there's something also really surprisingly simple, just walking the talk. If security is important, then you have to demonstrate that. Nothing frustrates smart people more than hypocrisy and inconsistency. They will walk out the door because they have options, right? So you have to give people something to strive for, resources to achieve it, and they'll stay. And so also want to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and Tim, you mentioned, like, I really enjoyed listening to Charles Finley talk about the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst on the first day. I love the idea of women and women from racialized backgrounds who don't necessarily fit into the predominantly bro culture of IT and, and getting top tier badass training, going out there into high paying cybersecurity technical roles. I don't think I need to elaborate too much for this audience that we need to have more emphasis on diversity to increase the potential candidate pool for the growing number of vacant positions in this field. But I want to intentionally say that we want to be careful never to imply that these diverse candidates are not as qualified or that we would lower our standards right, to include them. I think there are cases where there are people who are fully qualified and they eliminate themselves from opportunities because they don't see themselves as welcome or included. That's the inclusion part, right? The I in DEI and as, a leaders, as leaders, we have to create room for these people. So I'm sitting here as a CIO, but in my intro, Tim, you also mentioned I'm the board chair of Cuccio. And I credit the generosity and graciousness of Bo Wanschneider the CIO of U of T for helping to make that happen. So Bo was the vice chair of Cuccio a few years ago, and he deliberately stepped down in the middle of his term and asked me if I would put my name forward as vice chair. And that led the way to me taking the chair role this year. And if not for his support, I wouldn't have seen myself in this role or thought it was possible. And that's a direct result of how I grew up in my own lived experience. And so my message to all of you is there are people out there like me who would benefit from a tap on the shoulder. And so we need to take time to look for them. And in the meantime, thank you, Bo. 
Uh, that's that's great, Wendy. I we're we're really uh, running out of time. I was uh, I talked with the panel beforehand, um, trying to make themselves available in the networking lounge in the in the cybersecurity room uh, lounge number twelve. Immediately following this, because we do need to go to break now. But this is a great conversation. There are a few more questions in, that came up in the chat about policing and security, like the CIO role, CIO role in policing. And I think that there's a lot of interest in further exploring that role. And, and that was interesting from Rosh's perspective of we're not the police, the police are the police in, in terms of the cyber center. So it's 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 I love to see this conversation continue. I very very much thank everyone for their time and attention to this. I'm sorry we ran a little one minute over here, but we'll uh, convene now for the break and, and uh, we'll get back together at uh, three o'clock. Thanks everyone very much. Mm -hmm.